Something unexpected is going on in traditionally conservative Saudi Arabia. Over the past few years, the kingdom has been announcing a loosening of social restrictions at a surprising rate. Change is underway in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has lifted some restrictions on women traveling in the ultra-conservative Muslim kingdom. The first stadium opens its doors to women in the Red Sea city of Jidda today. That includes reopening movie theaters, opening up new professional opportunities for women, and hosting Western-style music festivals. What you say? It's all part of a plan by the country's de facto leader, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, to dramatically transform his country. But this push only goes so far. While dancing in Saudi Arabia might be in these days, political dissent is still most definitely out. I'm Gustavo Ariano. You're listening to The Times, essential news from the LA Times. It's Monday, January 16th, 2023. Today, are social reforms bringing meaningful change to Saudi Arabia or just masking a leader's move to consolidate his political power? Here to talk about the extent of the kingdom's makeovers is my LA Times colleague, foreign correspondent Nabi Bulos. Nabi, welcome to the Times. Thank you for having me. So I saw that you went to Saudi Arabia at the end of this past year. What did you do there? So I had gone there for two weeks, and I spent some time around in Jeddah at this music festival called Belad Beast. I'm here right now in Jeddah, and this is the second night of Belad Beast, a large music festival taking place in Jeddah's old quarter. This was very much a sort of hip hop, pop, <laughs> electronic music, everything. It was, it was really something. I mean, it was huge. It should be noted that there was no alcohol, right? So everything was kind of fueled by caffeine and everyone's eyes were kind of just, you know, popped up because they're so over caffeinated. They had these rock star energy drinks and Red Bull. They stayed up until two or three or 4 a.m. I mean, I left at some point, frankly, but people were partying hard and they were having a great time. It's hard to overstate how much of a surprise this is these days. And one must say, this would have been just impossible a few years ago. And why stop by this festival? I mean, what was so cool about it? Was it like a Coachella or something? Okay, so this is Saudi Arabia, right? I mean, when I was a child growing up in Jordan, the image of Saudi was just this very, very religious place, you know, as the birthplace of Islam, the place where people would go and do the Hajj or Umrah, right? which is the pilgrimage or the little pilgrimage. And it had this very, very austere image of a place where women cannot drive, women don't really have many rights, they're always wearing niqab, this black face covering. This was something very different from that image, very, very different. I mean, the notion of having women out dancing, to have men and women dancing together, just the whole thing was just such a shift change from what Saudi Arabia is usually seen as from the outside. And indeed, from how the country saw itself only a few years ago. And who is responsible for it ultimately is, of course, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince. You know, this music festival is part of this larger vision by the prince called Vision 2030. And one big part of it is opening Saudi Arabia up and what that means is just having all these new entertainment options. In fact, so much so that the prince opened up in 2016 something called the General Entertainment Authority. And that thing began with the idea of making Saudi Arabia into an entertainment destination, but also to create entertainment options inside the country itself, which is to say that they would support creators, they would support artists, also be open to bringing in artists from abroad too. And so what this has meant is really thousands, and, and it's true, thousands of events have been held in the last five years. You know, Jeddah, we had Belad Beast there. A few days earlier, it was the Red Sea International Film Festival. And after that, you had the Dakar Rally happening, right? This is all within a few weeks of each other. And Riyadh, in the meantime, you also have other things happening. You had something called Riyadh Season, you had this thing called the Winter Wonderland, which was like sort of a winter-themed amusement park that is quite large. You also have the Riyadh Boulevard. It's kind of like a world fair thing where you had different pavilions from different countries. And of course, you have a whole series of concerts happening and a whole series of events. I mean, really, it's quite overwhelming. 
But I don't understand this focus on bringing all these entertainment opportunities to Saudi Arabia. I mean, what problem was the Saudi government trying to solve here? I mean, the problem was that people would go, well, either to Dubai or to Bahrain for their entertainment. And that was a lot of money being lost from the state's treasury. And Saudi Arabia, it had no theaters, it had no movie places, it had no concerts. And so they changed all that with the intention of basically creating entertainment options at home and making the Saudis spend their money at home. And it really is something for a country that up to a few years ago was considered a hermit kingdom. But beyond the concerts and all this fun, what other changes or social reforms are part of this Vision 2030? I mean, obviously, the big one is just that you see women everywhere, right? And not just sort of with the niqab, but they're also uncovered, you know, with the hair. And they're walking around and they're talking and they're very visible. And they are really a part of everyday life, which is to say that you see them in the supermarket and at other places. And they're working behind the counter, right? You see them as waitresses. You see them as hostesses. You see them really everywhere at this point. I mean, the percentage of women joining the Saudi workforce now exceeds 35 percent. And that's more than double the rate that it was five years ago, according to official statistics. That's just a huge change already right there on the streets. It's really also a change in how the kingdom sees itself. I mean, this is now a place where they're trying really quite hard to shift away from oil. And you see people working everywhere, right? This is not like, for example, Qatar, where you see very few Qataris working in service jobs. This is not, say, the Emirates, where you see really very few Emiratis working in those jobs. No, Saudi Arabia is a proper country in the sense that you have 36 million people. And yes, there are rich people, but there are also poor Saudis. And there you see them actually working in these jobs, and it really is quite striking, both men and women. Coming up after the break, what Vision 2030 really means for Saudi Arabia. Nabi, before the break, you were talking about Vision 2030 and all these unprecedented social reforms that Mohammed bin Salman is trying to implement. And it seems like a lot for such a traditionally conservative place and going against decades, if not centuries of social mores. Does the prince have the power to implement all of this? Well, in a nutshell, yes. The prince came to power in the beginning, in 2015, when his father became king. He was appointed as deputy crown prince, I believe, and also defense minister. So that was already quite a powerful portfolio right there. He was the youngest defense minister in the world. Some have called him assertive and quick to act. And then in 2017, he was appointed crown prince after having basically outmaneuvered his rivals in the various Saudi families that were also vying for the role. With his father's support, he's run the state oil company, overseen public investments, and been involved in the kingdom's economic policies. And then he basically cemented his power with this anti-corruption purge, where he really put a lot of princes and a lot of important figures on notice. Remarkable times in Saudi Arabia. There's been an unprecedented anti-corruption purge with sweeping arrests of senior politicians and business leaders and members of the royal family. And this was an important time in 2017 when the Crown Prince detained princes and dozens of others in the Ritz-Carlton. They're not being thrown into some dark dungeon. They are reportedly staying in great comfort at the Ritz-Carlton. And critics would call it a power grab or a shakedown where he basically threatened people to pay back the money they had stolen from, say, coffers or through corruption, right, or face consequences. Everybody in Saudi sees this as the hand of the very ambitious, dynamic, and controversial crown prince. After that, it was clear that he had also consolidated his power over the security apparatus in the government. So, yes, in terms of the government, at least, he is in control of all levers of power. And in fact, recently, he was appointed as the prime minister, which cemented this power even further. So he is definitely able to do those reforms. So is Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030 working? Well, to be fair, it is perhaps too early to say. It is working in the sense that they are spending a lot, a lot of money. And they are trying their damnedest, I have to say, to open up the country to tourism. And at the same time, there are people who are working more and more. Right? There is more stuff happening outside of oil. And it should also be said that even if, let's say, the greater aim of Vision 2030 fails, it is undoubtedly true that for girls, you know, this generation, it is just, again, a total sea change. And I'd be hard-pressed to see that going back. But, and of course there's a but, right? This social liberalization has been accompanied by political crackdown. He's managed to 
really silence rivals very effectively. They're much more afraid to speak because, frankly, the consequences for doing so are far higher now. There is, of course, a very, very strong police state. I mean, there's no room for dissent at this point. That seems clear. I mean, people you would talk to would say that before there was perhaps, you know, some space to speak. Now, I mean, especially if you were a journalist or a commentator, it's to the point where, you know, if you're not enthusiastically cheering on enough, you might get in trouble for having questioned the vision. Yeah, it's just this bifurcation between, yes, liberalizing at least society in Saudi Arabia. A lot of people would say, oh, cool, that's really good. But on the other hand, bin Salman is probably most infamous in this country for being linked to the murder of a U.S.-based journalist a few years ago. Right, right. I mean, we covered the killing of, of Jamal Khashoggi. And it should be said, Jamal Khashoggi was... I mean, he's been billed as a critic, but he was, I must say, a very, very mild critic. And for the most part, was actually quite in line with a lot of what was being done in Saudi Arabia. And his killing was brutal, of course. And it should be noted that the CIA and, and the US government had concluded that it was Bin Salman who had ordered the killing. And he, of course, denies it and says it was rogue elements within a security apparatus. But it's important to note that MBS is in power at this point, and he will remain to be so. And a great example of this comes from the religious establishment. I mean, if you consider how things used to be, you had the religious police, right? They were called the mutawa'in, and they would go around malls or streets, and they would sort of beat up men and women if they were wearing things, you know, which were inappropriate, or talking to each other if they're not married or have some sort of blood relation. I mean, things were very bad, and there were a few instances where the religious police would basically chase people down. And so these were just unpopular figures in Saudi society, especially among the young. And then Bet Salman came, and basically overnight, and said that they're not allowed to do this anymore, that their only role is to give advice, right? That they have to basically just be completely defanged and stop the patrols and stop the patrols they did. And really any cleric who spoke out against this decision was quickly imprisoned or made to repent in some way or recant their statement. I mean, that's a measure of how powerful he had become and that he was able to defang the religious police as an institution, that is a huge deal in Saudi Arabia. And he did it really overnight and without a peep from anyone. It really is all in the hands of Mohammed bin Salman. And of course, it's not just on the clerical class or the religious class, right? There is also a political aspect to it where anyone who criticizes MBS or the royal family or these various policies, right, on Twitter or elsewhere is really, again, just pursued and shut down. And so in August, we also saw this Saudi woman was given 34 years in prison for using Twitter. And when I asked Saudi authorities about this, I was told that, of course, it was much more about Twitter, but they refused to give details. This speaks to a, a very intolerant atmosphere when it comes to anyone expressing dissent. So how do people in Saudi Arabia feel about this crackdown? I mean, all these social reforms that Mohammed bin Salman has implemented, are they worth it despite the repressive measures? So with that being said, too, and this is something you hear from young people all over the country, is that without doing that, without him going in such a heavy-handed way, right, there is no way those reforms would happen. The idea is that he's also done things which are really very popular with young people. And it's really quite striking in that regard, in that most of the people who are criticizing are of the older guard or people who have actually suffered the consequences of being excised and being put on notice by the prince. But most of the young people I spoke to, I must say, everyone seemed very happy with the changes. And of course, it makes sense. I mean, if you are now a 16-year-old girl, for example, right, in school, it's just a total sea change for you from 10 years ago. And so therefore, I mean, of course you would support those changes. More after the break. Nabi, Saudi Arabia has always been a huge player in the Gulf, largest country by far. So I'm curious, what has Mohammed bin Salman's rise to power and his attempts at both reform and consolidating his power meant for his country's neighbors? So let's say he had a rocky start. I mean, when he first came to power in 2015, he launched the war in Yemen. Or more accurately, he didn't launch the war in Yemen, but he took it to another phase. The Saudi-led coalition has waged an airstrike campaign for more than two months. He brought in, really, this coalition to start attacking Yemen. And that's when we started seeing the state of siege that really continues, really, to this day. The country of some 25 million people is dealing with shortages of food, water, medicine, and electricity. And also, he had this run-in with the Prime Minister of Lebanon. In fact, he was accused of kidnapping him. 
the announcement from Prime Minister Hariri that he was resigning really took the country by surprise. And the fact that he announced it in a televised address from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, not from Lebanon, made it even more surprising. And there was also another situation in Jordan where he was involved in this attempt to basically bring in King Abdullah of Jordan's half-brother, Prince Hamza, to try to take over his place. Oh, and of course, there was the Qatar blockade right, that happened for a few years and then finally was let go. The Emir of Qatar embraced the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman as he arrived in Saudi Arabia for a summit aimed at resolving the rift. And so perhaps it's fair to say that in his earlier rise to power, he had overstepped and he had basically gone for this more robust foreign policy that often backfired. But it should be said that since then, things have calmed down considerably. He's tried to mend fences with Qatar. In fact, we saw him at the World Cup. And the same thing is happening with Jordan and other places. I mean, now there really is a focus on trying to forge links with those countries and to basically use business and commerce to do so. All this upheaval in the region, both the foreign policy and what's happening within Saudi Arabia, how is it influencing the country's relationship with the United States? Well, it's hard to say that the relationship is good. I mean, of course, we've seen outwardly that the relationship is very bad between President Biden and MBS, and this remains to be so. A meeting to repair one of the world's most important diplomatic relationships has started with a fist bump. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman tapping President Biden's fist. There was little evidence of warmth between the men. And People who sort of read body language, I mean, they had a field day when Xi Jinping visited Saudi Arabia last month because, you know, obviously that was a very, very different kind of greeting than the somewhat tepid fist bump that was given to Joe Biden when he visited, right? Yeah, what happened when the president of China visited Saudi Arabia? So I actually came in to cover that specifically. And it should be said, we weren't allowed to be on the grounds when she actually arrived and said hello to MBS, but it was, of course, broadcast on state TV. I mean, there's just a lot of pomp and circumstance. You had the limousine coming in, you had Xi Jinping stepping out onto this red carpet, and it was all very, very sort of orchestrated to be, I mean, the ultimate in pop and circumstance. And then he was driven to the palace at some point in time to meet MBS, and when Xi steps out, there's MBS waiting for him, and they have a warm five-second handshake as opposed to this fist bump, and of course everyone is smiling and everyone is happy. There's a much grander welcome, right, for Xi Jinping than had been given to President Biden a few months before that. I mean, there's a sense that Saudi Arabia is turning away from the U.S., but it should be said that this is, at some level, a superficial reading, because that relationship is really very strong, and the fact is it's institutional at this point. So the relationship with Saudi and the U.S. first began actually with Roosevelt. So really, I mean, <laughs> you know, the 30s and 40s, we're talking a long, long time ago. And much as it is now, it was girded on oil, which is to say that I mean, Saudi Arabia has a lot of it and the U.S. needs it. And it's all about guaranteeing world supply. And the idea is that the U.S. would be the guarantor of Saudi security. And what that means in practice is that obviously you have a large U.S. base, in Saudi Arabia. The Saudi army uses U.S. equipment for the most part. And then with that come, of course, billions, if not trillions of dollars at this point, of weapons contracts and maintenance and logistics and all these other things. Things have been changing in more recent years because right in Saudi Arabia at this point is, as I said, having a more robust foreign policy. It's more interested in, in forging its own path, but also equally, right, this Vision 2030 requires a lot of money, which requires oil to have a certain price. I mean, for Saudi Arabia to actually balance its budget, the price has to be, I believe, anywhere from 75 to $80. And the way this goes is, is that, I mean, at this point, Saudi Arabia will basically follow the policies that will keep the oil at that level, right? Regardless of what anyone else wants, because again, the demands are huge on its treasury, right? Just for the sheer amount of investment that it's been doing. That's really interesting. And it makes me think, what's next for the US and Saudi Arabia? So it's a changing relationship in the sense that now there's also a feel that Saudi Arabia is more interested in having more of a peer relationship with the US, right? Not so much a I mean, one who provides the oil and, and you give us protection. No, now there's a sense that there's I mean, a desire to move beyond that. And the fact is that it will continue to be important because obviously with the Ukraine war and sort of oil supplies all over the world being disrupted by that, Saudi Arabia is the biggest game in town and it remains to be so. 
But even more beyond that, Saudi Arabia now is in the middle of a huge construction boom. They're spending really tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, in fact. One estimate said that the total, I think, value of awards is about $719 billion, of which only 4% have been spent. And that is a gargantuan amount of money, and the U.S. will definitely be involved in trying to get some of that, whether publicly, right, as government, or privately as businesses. Finally, Nabi, what do you make of all of this? What do you make of uh, Mohammed bin Salman's strategy, Vision 2030, all of that? I mean, what does it mean to have a country like Saudi Arabia basically experiment with the way it governs itself and the way it's ran? Look, the thing is that our view of Saudi Arabia, again, is that this is a dictatorship and that it's very hard to speak out and that anyone who speaks out is going to get quashed and it's all terrible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I have to say, when visiting the country, right, you don't get that sense at all. People are really, I must say, excited to be involved in this point. And the Vision 2030, as farcical as it may sound sometimes, people are really actually quite interested in engaging in it. You're seeing, as I said, women in the workplace, right? Oftentimes you see them occupying half of the office. I mean, this is not mere window dressing. At the same time, you are seeing all these businesses open. You are seeing a sea change in social mores, right? That is a big deal in the country. And unlike other countries, I mean, Saudi Arabia actually has 36 million people. That is a large number of people. And with those kinds of resources, they should be able to achieve something proper, right? Something lasting. And I must say, I mean, I hope they do with the understanding of all the questionable practices done by the government. But it should be said that the Middle East is full of such governments, unfortunately. And then the question comes up as this, would he have been able to have done all these reforms without having such a political crackdown? It's unclear, to be honest with you. And this isn't to say that that's unjustified, but it does sort of raise questions as to what we think or how things would have worked otherwise. Nabi, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this episode of The Times, essential news from the LA Times. Kasha Brasalian was a hef on this episode, and it was edited by Hasmin Aguilera and Mario Diaz mixed and mastered it. Our show is produced by Denise Guerra, Kasha Brasalian, David Toledo, and Ashley Brown. Our editorial assistants are Roberto Reyes and Nicholas Perez. Our fellow is Helen Lee. Our engineers are Mario Diaz, Mark Nieto, and Mike Heflin. Our editor is Kinsey Moreland. Our executive producers are Hasmin Aguilera, Shani Hilton, and Hiba El Orbani. And our theme music is by Andrew Ethan. I'm Gustavo Ariano. We'll be back Wednesday with all the news in this month. Gracias. Gracias.